tonight we're going to be talking about the Battle of Jericho. This isn't your ordinary fight. So it's got a lot of really cool, very interesting ways of how they defeated a very, very powerful city. Or at least the walls and just the city itself was just huge and thick. And the way they defeated it was not a way you would ever expect. So, before we dig in, we're going to pray, because you guys are really distracting. It's really distracting me. We're going to dig in to that, okay? So, dear God, uh, as we dig in tonight, I just pray that ultimately the words that I speak will be truth, and that they will reflect uh, what your word has to say, and that uh, it brings honor and glory to you and to help further your kingdom, God. I pray that tonight we'll get a better understanding of you and who you are. And all that you do for us, God. And uh, I just please pray that you would just intervene and please just help us stay focused tonight. As I think uh, there's a lot of really cool things we can learn from the story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. So, God, just please help us stay attentive with our ears and our eyes and not be distracting to others. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Oh, wait, hold on. you got to turn it on. Okay. So like I said, this is not your ordinary fight. So Joshua is the leader of the people of God, who are the Israelites at this time. And so they have soldiers, they have an army, but they didn't defeat Jericho with necessarily large machinery or equipment to break down the walls, to break in. Later on, they did go in and they used their sword. But the initial getting into the city was purely God alone and by faith alone. And they actually did it by just marching in the sounds of the trumpets that they blew. How crazy is that to think about? And to think that now today we have like bombs and all this crazy stuff that we use. And these guys took out a whole city by just marching, having faith, and the sound of trumpets and shouting. So I think there's two key people that we'll learn about in the Battle of Jericho. And the first one is Joshua, who we'll talk about first. And the second one is uh, Rahab. So there's what Joshua might look like, so you can get a visual for all your visual learners. Yeah, he looks kind of weak. I thought he'd be like real muscular. Isn't that like what all leaders look like? Where's his big, like, armor? Yeah. But that dude defeated a city. Can you believe that? No, oh, no. With God. So, so Joshua. So, I don't know how much you know about the, the Israelites. But, and how Joshua came into that. But you first had Moses. Does everybody remember Moses? He's the one that did all the plagues in Egypt. And then he started leading God's people out to the promised land, right? And they marched around forever. So Joshua was Moses' like right hand man. Okay? So once Moses died, Joshua then was chosen to be the leader. And he's the one that actually led the people of God as they finished their march into the promised land. So Moses started it, and then Joshua was the one that came up next to finish it. And the thing about Joshua is he had perfect submission to God. Everything, everything God told Joshua to do, Joshua did it. And he did it exactly how God wanted it. Joshua never went out on his own and did it his way. He did it the exact way that uh, God told him to do it. So here's a side note. The promised land occupied the same geographical territory as modern day Israel. So I pulled up a little map for you. There's your, there's your modern day promised land right there right where Israel's at. So you got Europe over here, Africa, kind of give you an idea. And then here's Israel, the outline. And then I believe, um, I think Jericho was like right 
right there, roughly. And then right here is the Jordan River. And the Jordan River is a significant part of the story because they had to cross that to get there. And then we have Rahab. Rahab's another key part. I feel like that might be out of order. All right, so Rahab. How Rahab gets in the story is Joshua, he sent two spies out to go scope out the land. And part of that scoping out the land, he went out, he sent those spies to go out to Jericho. So these two spies, they actually went into Jericho, and being Israelites, they were definitely not wanted there, or not supposed to be there. And so while they were there, they, uh, the people of Jericho found out that there were two Israelites there, and they were trying to find them. So they actually went to Rahab's house, the two spies were at Rahab's house, and so the people of Jericho came looking, and they came to Rahab, and we, they said, if we know you have the Israelites here, tell us where they're at. And, they, and Rahab fibbed and said, they ran off already. Maybe if you start heading out of the city, you'll find them and catch up with them. When really, they were just hiding on the roof from them. And so once the dust kind of settled there, they kind of came back out and they started talking to Rahab. And Rahab said, she knows that God, that Jericho, belongs to the Israelites. She already knows that God told them that Jericho belongs to the Israelites. And that Rahab said that her and all the people of Jericho, they actually feared the people of it, the Israelites because they knew all the crazy things that they've been doing and that's happened and the fear that and they knew that God was with them. And so they feared the Israelites because of that. And so because Rahab was the one who hid them, and kept them secret. She said, promise me that you'll protect me and my family when you guys come to take Jericho. So the spies said, yes, we will. Make sure you and all of your family are in your house, and we'll make sure you are protected. And the reason why I had that picture was Rahab's house was built into the city wall, and she had a window. So she lowered them down the city wall from her window on a rope. And she left that rope in the window to signify to which house was hers, so when they came to take over Jericho, they knew not to hurt that family in there. So the spies then went back and they told Joshua that God had given them Jericho, and that once they had scoped it out, that then gave Joshua the okay that they need to start heading that way towards Jericho to conquer it. So they're off to Jericho. So remember I said they were on the other side of the Jordan River, and you have the Jordan River, and then you have Jericho. So they first had to get over the Jordan River. And that sounds a lot easier said than done. Because when they actually crossed the Jordan, the Jordan River, this was during high flood time. And so it was obviously at max capacity. And it's not like your little creek that you could just like skip a rock over it, and then be fine. And so for a little interesting fact, in the fire service, for the fire departments that have water rescue, uh, when water is moving five miles per hour or faster, that is considered swift water. And water is a crazy powerful thing. I don't know if you've ever been whitewater rafting or, or been in it, but it's is crazy that, of how powerful water can be. So just think about it, five miles per hour. That's how fast an average person walks. And so that speed and faster is considered swift water, and that could easily take you down river. So that's kind of how it was during this time. And so as they were doing their march, they had what was called the Ark of the Covenant. Has any of you heard of the Ark of the Covenant? No. It was actually pretty new to me. I've heard of the Ark of the Covenant, but I actually learned a lot about it this last week. That's probably the coolest part of preparing for this lesson. But God told Joshua to go ahead and cross the river. And once the Ark of the Covenant hit the water, the water would then stop. So sure enough, like I said, Joshua had great submission and faith. They went ahead and started walking into the river. And once the Ark hit the river, 
it then dammed the river. And so the water kept flowing, but it stopped. So the water would kind of like pool up where they were, and then the water kept receding past them. So they had a clear path to walk through. And then once they were out and the ark was out, then the water came back through. So they keep marching, and then they finally come up to Jericho. And they come across a man right before they get there. And so this is when we're going to dig into our Bibles that everybody grabbed. And we're going to go to Joshua chapter 5. And it, uh, Joshua is right after Deuteronomy. It's in the Old Testament, pretty close to the beginning. So Joshua chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 13. there? So like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Oh, thank you. Numbers in there too. All right, so Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. We're going to go ahead and start reading. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him when, with a sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, Are you friend or foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face in the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Can you guys please stop talking? Thank you. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priest blowing the horn. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as, Lord, as, as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. So isn't that crazy that God told them that they were going to conquer a city by just marching around and shouting and then blowing the trumpet's horn? But also, how, how much confidence would that give you if God already told you that you had already had victory over it before you even started your fight? So I kind of wanted to go into the ark a little bit. Because I know I brought it up once, and that's when they crossed the Jordan River. And then they brought up the ark again, how they were supposed to walk around Jericho for seven days with the ark. And so the ark is called the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of Testimony. Those are two of the several names that it had. An ark, the definition in the Webster Dictionary, means something that affords protection and safety. So that's why, like, even Noah's ark, because that was their protection and safety during the flood. And so now you have the Ark of the Covenant, which, as you'll see, this was a, another form of protection and safety for, the, for God's people, the Israelites. That was, it gave them safety as they went through the river, and then it gave them safety as they marched around Jericho. And this is where God's presence manifested. Like God's little, literal presence was there, and it was called the mercy seat. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there's three things. Does anybody know? Without looking. Yep. Yeah. 
um, it was actually, I know it's more referred to Aaron's staff, but a lot of people said that, or a lot of people think that that was the same staff Moses did use. So yes, I would say you're, you're right. So they had Aaron's staff that budded and blossomed. There's two other things. Yep. The Ten Commandments. One more. And a gold pot of manna. And so manna was this, it was like bread or yeast. It was a special food that God gave the Israelites in the desert to feed them and provide food for them. And then you had the, the rod that budded, which is probably the same staff that Moses used, Aaron rod. And Aaron was Moses' brother, and he was the first high priest. And then obviously the Ten Commandments that God uh, carved the Ten Commandments in. So that's what the ark looked like. And then you have the, um, the cherubims. I think I'm saying that right. Which are the two angels up there. And in the middle, that's the mercy seat. And that's where God's little presence was. So isn't that kind of crazy that they literally had God's presence right there with them as they made the march? So there's, again, there's the three significance of belongings. And those are three obviously significant things that God did. And going back to Aaron's staff, see, they didn't like, the Israelites complained about having him or who was supposed to be high priest. So God had every leader, which is basically families of Israel or tribes of Israel, which are just families, bring all their staffs. And then Moses put them into the Ark of the Covenant. And the next day when he opened it, all the sticks were dead, but Aaron's was the only one that had blossomed and was alive and had budded. And so it proved that Aaron was supposed to be the high priest because God chose Aaron to be the high priest. So they continued to march. In, chap- in chapter 6, verse 8, it says, After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horn started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. So again, that would just be crazy to just be marching literally in the presence of the Lord, knowing that you had the presence of the Lord right in front of you as you made your march to conquer the city. And during the six days, they never shouted or said a word. And every day they marched around Jericho once. Then, on the seventh day, they marched around Jericho seven times. And then when they blew their horns, and Joshua told them, commanded him, they all shouted, and the walls came down. I don't remember, I know I looked it up the last time I taught on this, so I'm going off of memory, so don't quote me on this. I'm pretty sure the walls of Jericho were 14 feet thick. I want to say I mean, they were, like, incredibly thick. I know they were ridiculously tall. To give you a little bit of perspective of how well surrounded Jericho was. So let's look at your Bibles. We'll go to Joshua chapter 6, verse 15. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done done before. But this time they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, the priests sounded the long blast on their horn. Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed. As an offering to the Lord, only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. And then jump down to 20. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, They shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, goats, and donkeys. So again, the Israelites, God's people, had defeated Jericho by just being obedient 
and having faith that God was going to come through and do what he said he was going to do. So I think there's some very similar applications that we can use today to apply to our own lives. Because I know we don't necessarily have a city that we're trying to take over or we're marching around to destroy. But looking back on the battle of Jericho, remember God told Joshua that Jericho was theirs before they even started the war. So before they even were there to fight Jericho, God already said, it's yours. You're already victorious. So they went to battle knowing the enemy was defeated. And the thing is, we too, we battle an enemy that we know is already defeated. And our enemy is Satan. And yeah, we're going to face trials. We're going to go through a little bit of hard times. We're going to face obstacles. But as long as we're obedient and we have faith, we have the confidence of saying our enemy is already defeated. We are already told that we're going to be victorious for all that we believe. Huh? Six feet thick? So maybe they're 14 feet tall. Did you say that? All right. Like I said, they don't quote me. Yeah. Well, thank you. Now, you. now you can quote Google. Siri. Oh. Yeah? So, so what did God tell Joshua before they started? What did Joshua tell? Or what did God tell Joshua before they started? You've already won. Exactly. And that they're already victorious, right? And so, God told them that Jericho was already theirs. So would that be equivalent that God tells us that the eternal kingdom is already ours, if we're believers? That gives me a lot of hope as I go through life. Because every now and then, I have a bad day and I have tough things that happen. But knowing that this is just a short time here and that I'll eventually get to go to heaven and be with my eternal Father because that's what He's already promised me. But it's through faith and through those who are believers. Alright. So that's it. Um... We will pray, and we have a little bit awkward time to finish, but we'll probably go ahead and break up in groups. I already prepared the leaders for this, so that was kind of rough, I thought, on my part, maybe, but also, you guys weren't very listening. You did? You did all right. Yeah. So, let's pray. We'll break up into groups for about five minutes or so, and then we'll get ready to worship. So, dear God, we just... uh. Come before you, God. We're still thankful that we can come together to a place to learn about you. And despite the difficulties sometimes of uh, listening and being an audience or just even teaching or trying to prepare a lesson, um, I know that there can still be truth found in that and that we're still thankful that we come here to listen and to hang out and to be in a whole an atmosphere of love and to ultimately know about you and we feel that love from you because we get to come here, God. So... I just pray as we hopefully learned a little bit about the Battle of Jericho that the next time we're facing uh, a tough time, we're going through something that Satan is trying to trick us with or tempt us with or put in front of us, God, that you have already told us that he's defeated and we've already been victorious. So I pray that we'll hold on to that confidence as we go out through life. And if maybe we don't have that confidence, that we'll have the courage to go talk to somebody in the not only hear about it, but to understand it. So God, we just give this all to you. In your name we pray, amen.